Oh my goodness gracious. Miyazaki, I'm pouring honey on you, goat. What a great expansion. Shadow of the Earth Tree is FromSoft's biggest and greatest expansion yet, and it may very well be the greatest DLC package ever made. It's like if you took the incredible and monumental boss battles from Old Hunters and Artorias of the Abyss, mashed them together into the varied and interesting locations of the Dark Souls 2 DLCs, doubled the boss count, and put them all together into a gorgeous and intricate open world that serves as an excellent final challenge for this now two and a half year old game. And it really feels more like a half sequel, Elden Ring 1.5 if you will, rather than just a DLC expansion, having 11 major bosses on top of a heap of minor and field bosses. And today, I thought it would be again, cool and fun, to rank the DLC bosses from worst to best, all of which is just my humble opinion of course. But like base game Elden Ring, it's a bit difficult to figure out what should be counted as a true, fully realized boss, and what isn't. For example, are the Mausoleum NPC fights boss battles? Sure, they have boss health bars, but they're just human type enemies. And what about all the recycled base game bosses that got transported to the Land of Shadow, like these Erdtree Sentinels or the Meteor Rock Horse thing? So, just like last time, I have a few rules to filter out the unworthy bosses from the worthy ones. And these rules are, rule number one, it must be a new boss type to the DLC. Senesax, Demi-Human Queen Mariga, the Tree Sentinels, the Falling Star Beast, and the Jagged Peak Drakes, and so on, are all too similar to base game bosses to truly count. Rule number two, similar boss types will be joined together to count as one entry, such as all the Death Knights, the Black Knights, the Red Bears, and so on. For example, Ralva the Red Bear and Rugalea the Red Bear are not different enough to be counted as separate entries. Rule number three, Bosses that later appear as normal enemies, or are powered up versions of enemies, will not count, except for the Hippo, as he is required to kill before entering the Shadow Keep from the south. And number four, I won't count any NPC or human fights, because they're not really boss battles, and encounters like the Mausoleum bosses mostly exist to introduce you to new DLC weapons, rather than being fully realized boss battles. And I also won't count the duel with Lita and Dane, even though it's required, as your enjoyment of that fight will come down to how much of the NPC side content you did. As if you complete their quests, you can bring along a gang squad of your own to take her on. But for me, I mostly missed these quests, and it ended up being a 3v1 gang squad reborn fight between me, Lita, Dryleaf Dane, and Hornscent, which was some hot ass. I also won't really talk about the Shadow Tree fragments and the optimal fragment level for each boss, even though these fragments could be the difference between a great boss battle and an exercise in futility where your late game 170 plus level character can get two shotted by two naked dudes in a lion puppet costume. So as far as those go, just get your fragments up as much as you can. And if you think you hit a wall with a boss, just disengage, take a walk, go gather up some more fragments, and come back when you're powered up. And there's no shame at all in looking up a guide as to where they are to speed up the process. Look, Miyazaki himself even said guides are totally fine. Nobody's looking. They won't even know you did it. Also, obviously, spoilers for all of Shadow of the Earth Tree. But with all of that out of the way... We can jump right into the Shadow Realm and take a look at the worst boss in the expansion. The... It's definitely the oddest boss in this expansion, as these crusty oversized hippos can be found in multiple places wandering around the lands of Shadow, acting as living flesh pinatas to harvest some extra Shadow Tree fragments from. But when you first enter the Shadow Keep from the south, you have to kill the Hippo Bouncer Mesmer left here to gain full access to the dungeon. Although you can avoid the Hippo completely by entering the East Side Church District, most players me included, just went through the front door and got greeted by this bastard. The Hippo has a pretty unimpressive moveset to start, being mostly telegraphed head swipes, slams, and bite attacks that do some solid damage. And watch out for the chomp grab he does when he opens wide and soy jacks before charging you. It's all typical beast enemy shit. The fight only starts to get interesting in his second phase, when the Hippo spawns some massive sweet looking crucible porcupine quills, and he can now shoot down spikes, blast them out like a shotgun, or he can do this massive jump slam that leads into a roll that I can never quite get the timing down on. But besides these new quill attacks, it's just more of the same head slam dodging from the first phase, and I was able to stagger him a few times with some expertly placed jump slams on his large and relatively slow body. And from there, it's just rinse and repeat until the hippo is cut down for size. It's simply an okay fight. The massive quills are definitely cool to see, but they don't really add enough new moves to make the fight all that much better and the hippo's weak poise can let you really spank his ass raw if you're focusing on landing your heavy hits. It's alright, and it ends up just being a slight bump in the long, hard road that is this DLC. D-tier. Oh yeah? I think my scary, otherworldly, shadowy spirit friends might have something to say about that. The ultimate situational awareness boss of this DLC. Jory is a powerful Hornscent Inquisitor with a deep bag of Hornscent incantations, like shooting off Crescent projectiles both big and small, like large shots, triple shots, 
a flurry of crescent projectiles, along with the ability to summon spiral light columns to blend your ass up if you don't stay on the move. This first phase almost feels like a bullet hell game. Chori brought a damn automatic to a sword fight, and you'll be dodging a pretty much constant stream of projectiles as you close the gap between you and Jory, who is constantly teleporting away to reposition and to mag dump another round of horn sent bullets into you. Once you take off about a quarter of his health, Jory starts summoning a gang squad of horn sent inquisitor ghosts to try and swarm you, summoning both little guys and obese guys to overwhelm me with both physical and ranged attacks, which got me a few times as I tried to focus on Jory instead of his summoned ghosts. To beat Jory, the name of the game is management, cutting down his summoned goons, closing the gaps and dodging his gunshots, and managing the summoned gang squad until he's destroyed. It's a unique ranged boss that feels distinct from the rest of the game's bosses, but Jory's limited moveset and his reliance on summoning gang squads to kill you makes this one of the weaker bosses for me. I'm just not a big fan of these horde style boss battles. C tier. <laughs> The red bears look like if the rune bears from the base game took a sip of some crucible juice, sporting some twisted horns on their heads and red ascended fur. But despite the intimidating appearance and the rune bear PTSD I have from the base game, these red bears are thankfully much more balanced and enjoyable to fight than their hyper-aggressive brethren, who were programmed in the FromSoft office's portal to the seventh layer of hell. These bears have fast and strong bestial attacks like arm slams, claw swipes, and this super fast lunge that they can run you over with and they even have some AoE moves like blowing up the ground around them after a slam like Godfrey, and sending a huge bestial sling wave that hits you like a damn truck, so you gotta Mario jump over these. And from there, it's a fun and fast paced battle that forces you to learn the attack timings and the pace of the bear's movements, and you're rewarded for being aggressive, as you can avoid some claw swipe combos by getting close to the bear's belly, causing him to reach over you. And overall, it's a real solid, if unremarkable, beast battle. B tier. The guys waiting for you at the end of the Land of Shadows catacombs are these Death Knights, servants of the soulless dead demigod Godwin, and are equipped with some powerful lightning magic. And off the bat, everything about the presentation of these guys is so awesome. I love their armor sets with the ghostly tattered capes, skull-faced helmets, and the rune of death standing behind their helmet like it's some sort of grim halo. And all the while, Godwin's nasty-ass fishy dead face watches us. It's so fire. These guys use fast lightning attacks and incantations, being able to summon a flurry of lightning bolts, or can teleport to you in an instant to fry your ass with lightning imbued strikes and slams. And worst of all, they have a teleport grab where if they catch you, they will literally suck the soul out of you and heal themselves with your life essence. And if you get caught up in it, the fight is pretty much a wash. But unfortunately for these knights, their poise is piss poor, and my power stance greatsword jump and normal attacks were able to stagger them, which provided a ton of free hit opportunities and I was stunning them to their knees with little trouble. This weak ass poise making the fight so much easier. But despite their weak muscles, these death knights are some really sweet enemies that offer up some unique knight type enemy encounters that differ from the more generic black knights. B tier. I got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> these guys barely make the list. As on paper, they're just a ghost flame version of the flying field boss dragons from the base game. But once you get to actually fighting these guys, you'll find that they have some pretty interesting moveset updates that set them apart from the base dragons. First things first, it's another awesome boss design, being these rotted and skeletal dragons that are wrapped in ghostly torn rags, and it looks so sweet. They're still pretty similar to their base game brethren, having your classic flying dragon stomps, tail swipes, flying jumps, and flame breath attacks, but now it's chilling ghost flame instead, as the name suggests. But this dragon has a slew of new attacks to use, like new wing combos, new head slams and charges, and the ability to explode ghost flame AoEs out of stomps and has a massive ghost flame explosion attack. And it's so cool to watch the ghost flame course through the dragon's skeletal frame before exploding out. It's a great touch. And these new attacks make the fight much more well tuned for a dismounted duel with the dragon, as its attacks give you clear tells and combos for you to master and provide openings to lay into the thing if you dodge the assaults properly. And it's a noticeable step up from the base game's dragons in terms of fight pacing and structure. No more dodging slow attacks and then running away from a 2 km wide flame breath strafing run. And all these draconic tweaks, along with a sick design, make me rate it the best non-main boss on this list. Which then leads us into my least favorite remembrance boss. Mesmer's Hog Mountain Knight is an absolute beast in making you feel like a squirrel trying to cross a busy road, as this guy will charge you down and run you over with his pig any chance he gets. And this charge is an absolute bitch to dodge, and I can never consistently dodge it. Try to dodge through it, dodge to the side, run away in fear, no dice. 
This fat ass hog's hitbox always seemed to manage to clip me at the very last second, and any time I actually did dodge it, I could be chalked up to a fluke, as I could never consistently dodge this hog the same way twice in a row. And it wasn't until after I beat him that I realized that you could just jump this charge. My soul's brain is too strong. I'm a slave to that dodge button. And this charge is just the appetizer. As on top of it, Gaius also has strong gravitational magic attacks like rock slings, massive gravity spear attacks, and a flying hog corkscrew gravity slam that summons up jagged rocks to tear you several new assholes. Which only gets tougher in the second phase, as all his attacks have gravity imbued into them now and he can summon gravity wells to deny areas of the arena to pile on even more damage. And worst of all, he's got a brutal 7 hit combo where Gaius and his hog take turns separating your anus from your sphincter. And part of beating this boss is learning how to avoid this huge kill combo, as Gaius is a huge fan of using it. And all of this, plus his mobility, combines to make Gaius extremely efficient at killing you with huge charges, day long combos, and gravity attacks that obliterate your health bar. So you're gonna get spanked a few times. There's just no avoiding it. This fight could have been made so much better if the charge was just more consistently rollable, as I do really enjoy a lot of his moveset, like his sweet looking gravity attacks, and learning how to get around Gaius' combos was pretty exciting and rewarding, and he is no doubt the hardest rider boss in the entire game. I just wish he was slightly less punishing. Getting run over by the hog's obese hitbox and then having Gaius launch into his favorite 7 hit combo to end the fight in under 30 seconds was a bit too brutal at times, even for me. This dude Gaius was going belt to ass on some of these runs. But overall, the unique gravity attacks, fun to learn combos, and the cool hog and armor design saved this fight from being a total shit show. And I still overall enjoyed the pain he gave me. It just made the winning run that much sweeter. High B tier. Probably the weirdest boss difficulty wise, as technically she's supposed to be fought after Mesmer, as she guards the shadow tree we need to burn with Mesmer's flames. But despite coming after Mesmer, she's probably five times easier than the Snake Man himself, and was by far the easiest remembrance boss for me, and I got her on my first try. Isn't that sexy? Anyway, Romina's got another great design, being a flowery lady growing out of a massive centipede's body, and she's proper intimidating when you first see her. She feels like the fully realized version of the Scorpioness Noxia fight from Dark Souls 2. She can use her centipede body to roll and attack, both on the ground and through the air with some cool looking flying moves and uses her pink butterfly spear to perform some huge sweeping attacks, and to summon exploding butterfly hordes, which infect you with Scarlet Rod if hit, so watch out. And my favorite move, when she jumps up into the air, curls into a stinger, and tries to jab you from up on high, and I love the little glint the stinger gives off before striking too. It's a great way to intuitively telegraph the attack. But like I mentioned, Romina is simply too easy to rank her anywhere but here. Her spear attacks and centipede attacks reach out pretty far, you can avoid most of these attacks by getting aggressive and sticking close to her front, and her attacks will probably just miss right over you. And although you can catch Scarlet Rod if you let her butterflies fart on you, they're very easy to avoid. Just simply walk out of the butterfly zone, and you should be good to go. It's that simple. And from there, the rest of her attacks are also clearly telegraphed, and give you plenty of space to observe and react to them. Overall, it's a really cool enemy design with some fun attacks to dodge, but her weak damage output and her easily dodgeable attacks make me place her here. I beat here. All right, get the Dewalt out. It's time to do some weed whacking. The only boss in the entire game with three whole health bars is none other than this killer sunflower, which is found at the base of the shadow tree, which looks fucking fantastic. The massive jagged shadow tree shards sticking out from the murky black and gold shit water flowing from the shadow tree looming directly in front of you makes this probably the most striking boss arena in the entire game. It's visually spectacular. As for the avatar itself, it can use physical attacks like arm swings and slams, and some head slams too, but its trickiest moves are its incantations, as he can summon up thorny shrubs which can explode in a massive area, or can home in on you from the avatar itself, and it's pretty tricky to get the timing just right on when they pop out and scare you, as they surface, wait a sec, and then explode out to deal damage. And he also has some projectile moves, but they're pretty straightforward to dodge, just run and dodge to the left. Their avatar itself is pretty weak overall, especially on its sunflower head, and you can absolutely nuke its health bar with some well-timed slams to the face. And once it dies, it falls over and lets you critically stab it in its glowing weak point, and you'll always want to ram your weapon into this thing's face, as it'll remove about one-fourth of its health for its subsequent phase. There's literally no reason not to do this. The avatar will then die, regenerate, and will come back with new moves like a charge attack, and in the third phase, an electrode-esque self-destruct move where it ejaculates golden energy out at you. 
so steer clear. Also, this explosion is a lie, as the Avatar can explode up to three times in a row if you're close enough to him, and this almost killed my winning run on him even though he was one hit away from death. But luckily I just ate that shit with my 70 vigor and slew this shadowy weed for good. Overall, I enjoyed this battle a solid amount. The three health bar seems a bit overkill at first glance, but the Avatar's low health and nukeable head balances this out well, and each new phase keeps the fight tense and exciting with new moves introduced like the chain suicide bomb attack. And besides that, just don't get violated by the thorn spam, and you'll be just alright. A tier. Probably the most fascinating boss in the entire Elden Ring universe, Meta is a sort of secret boss that you can access after sticking your head in the finger bells at the finger ruins, these super mysterious stretches of land covered in ruined finger-like pillars and monoliths. And you progress this quest by talking to the finger freak Ymir at the chapel to proceed. And once you blow on all the finger ruins, you'll be teleported to a watery arena, with fingers growing out of the water, and these weird tube-like things hanging above you. Uh, no clue what these things are. And in the middle stands Metter, the mother of fingers, and her design is awesome. Being this massive malformed finger monster that gives me some serious Abritus vibes is grotesque on a cosmic level. Metter can slam you with her finger head, with her arms, and can flex her hand body or make it wiggle as a get off me move when you're butchering her flank. She can also jump up and reach into her front finger pouch, chucking her nasty ass finger children at you to attack. Yuck. And later on, she'll jump into the air and start spinning like the Tasmanian Devil. It will fly into you for some huge damage. But if you see this spin move coming, just run away. It should be good. And on top of these physical moves, she can also shoot lasers from her finger eye. In her second phase, she will conjure the simulacrum orb in her tail fingers and powers up her laser blast with repeated laser shots, a sweeping laser beam, conjuring exploding orbs, and my favorite, using her simulacrum as a rotating laser ball. And the effects here just look amazing. It looks like a black hole trying to piss on me. It's sweet. My issues with this fight is that it's a bit too much on the easy side, as Metter doesn't have a ton of health and she's wide open for big hits when you dodge her moves. Also, I wish she had more spectacle and cosmic moves like her black hole rotating laser, as a lot of her attacks are just boring slams and arm swipes, and I wish that they leaned a bit more into the cosmic power she wields. But despite the disappointing challenge, this boss is fantastic lore and design wise, and I really enjoyed the mysterious aura and lore revelation she brings, and after defeating her, you learn that Metter was the first being ever created by the greater will to ever fall in the lands between, predating even the Elden Beast it seems, as the beast too came from a falling star. She's the one who gave birth to all the two fingers, and the finger creepers. And most interestingly, we learn that Metter had not been in contact with the greater will for a long time, which could be damning for America's golden order. Was it not the greater will, but Metter who was pulling the strings all along? Was she the one speaking for the greater will? And was she the one who Merica and all the other two fingers have been communicating with the entire time? Was the greater will involved at all? Who knows? But what I do know is that guys like Vadi will be feasting off this DLC's lore ad rep for a long time. A tier. You've killed me! Good. Now we're starting to get into the real tough guys of the DLC. Starting with the flaming goop skeleton wearing the King Slime Mask from Terraria. You start the fight by jumping into a deep ravine, and while it's always fun to take these huge plunges in FromSoft games, and this fall gives me some nostalgia for the Dark Eater Madeir fight, it does start to drag on your 10th or so run back, having to fall 300 stories before each fight does add up time wise. But once you land, you gotta take on this speedy ass hunched over skeleton man riding on top of his legless goop horse, who's constantly on the move, weaving in and out to take swings at you, as well as doing this extended move where he ejects off his horse, turns into a plane turbine, and spin towards you with his massive cleaver. And once he spins past you, his horse pops out of the ground to charge you down, just before he starts barreling towards you again. And you have no time to heal or attack when he's doing this move, so you'll be forced to master the dodge timings of this attack, which was really fun and rewarding to figure out the timings for. We're going full on rhythm souls here. And in his second phase, he starts summoning blue flame AoEs that can come in waves and shoot out in a line at you on the ground, or will close in on you from behind in a circle. And jumping these flames is your best bet, as they linger on the ground for a good amount of time, which can still catch your jump if you're even slightly too early. But besides these flames, the second phase is pretty much unchanged from the first. Now, this fight has a good pace, and the moves are fun to learn and dodge, but I struggled a bit with the boss's mobility, as my playstyle relies on landing heavy jumping hits on on-end combo openings, and this boss was a bit frustrating to get my hands on when he's constantly running laps around you and fleeing after he completes a combo, which can cause the fight to get a little drawn out. But besides this mobility chicanery, this is still a pretty great fight that's pretty challenging, 
but totally doable on your own. And it's just super satisfying to pound this chicken-bodied skeleton and his goop horse into a sludge pile. A tier. I got two, two one for the plug and one for the load. Rolanda should have been the carrying queen. She makes her sister Ronaldo look like a bum. Rolanda is the first roadblock boss in this DLC. And if you see someone online bitching about overlong combos and roll catching, they're probably stuck on this boss. Rolanda is the secret child of Pontiff Sullivan, out for vengeance against me for killing her dad so many times. Rolanda uses her two swords as a great effect, performing fast strikes, long and staggered combos, stabs, and millennia as sidesteps. And you'll be struggling to predict her next moves and how her combos will play out keeping you constantly on your toes and spamming that dodge roll. Otherwise, she's almost oppressive with these combos. On top of her deep sword swing bag, she also has several glintstone sorceries like a flurry of arc projectiles, conjured swords, massive glintstone sword swings, and the scariest, and my favorite attack of hers, where Rolana conjures up her two moon balls, and then literally drops her entire nutsack on you, with the two moons creating arena-sized AoE shockwaves, before she drops down for a third final explosion. And if you get caught in the first two explosions, you're fucked, and you're gonna get juggled by moon bombs until you die. It's brutal, but so satisfying to dodge when you learn how to jump her balls just right. And once down to half health, Rolana powers up her swords, one with glintstone, and the other with mesmerian flame, with some new fiery and glintstone swing combos to match. And that's all on top of her normal combos, which deal extra damage now. And I've had a few runs in from messing up a combo's dodge timing, and my entire health bar was obliterated in one to three hits, which is probably my only real issue with this boss fight as getting her down to about a quarter of her health just to die in one combo from her juiced up swords was more than a bit frustrating. That second phase gives you very little room to breathe. Rolana is constantly pressing the attack, and properly healing is a rare luxury. But besides the occasional run getting nuked from orbit by misreading a flame sword combo, this was still overall a really great fight that blends physical and magic attacks really effectively, and it also incentivizes me to stay aggressive and to break her poise twice per battle, and to exploit these moments of respite to win, making this a pretty difficult but greatly fought battle. High A tier. It took them until the DLC, but we finally got a proper frenzied flame boss battle, and the wait was worth it. They cooked. Deep in the abyssal wood is the ruined mansion of Midra's Mance, the home of Midra, who seems to have gotten a little too freaky with the frenzied flame, and had his house raided by the Hornsen FBI, who killed his wife, or maybe it was his daughter, or his concubine, or someone. And they burned all his books, and skewered Midra himself with a sword that stabs you from the inside out. Probably a bit unpleasant. <laughs> when you first encounter Midra, he's a pathetic little emaciated naked guy who can only scream out in frenzied agony, or flop flaccidly towards you. But once you drain his health, a cutscene plays where Midra grabs his torture sword, and begins pulling it out of his body, ripping his head off along with it. And the animations and sound design are amazingly grotesque and unsettling. But it cuts to black before we see Midra decapitate himself fully. Maybe I'm just fucked up or something, but I really wish we saw his head fully come off and the frenzied flame take over his body. It would have given the scene even more impact and would even further intimidate the player. And when we cut back, we find that Midra's body had grown a bit, his tattered robe now loosely hanging off his body, and his head has been replaced with an orb of pure frenzied flame, and he uses the barbed sword he just pulled out of himself to attack. It seems that sword was the only thing keeping the frenzied flame at bay which forced Midra to endure the sensation of getting stabbed through his entire body in like 10 different places for who knows how long. And then the fight really begins. Midra has some really awesome looking attacks, as his freak ass emaciated body rotates around his frenzied flame head, as if the flame is controlling the body like a puppet on strings. And it was a pretty great time learning these inhuman movements and sword swings. He also pisses out frenzied flame projectiles all over from his head, which can build up your frenzy meter for some huge damage. But as long as you know how to avoid these projectiles more times than not, your frenzy meter won't be blowing up too often, thankfully. But it's always something to keep track of, and that buildup can turn any of Midra's combos into a deadly one, but at least the basic hits don't build up frenzy. Once you shave off about a fourth of his health, one fourth of the health bar seems to be the second phase cutoff for Shadow of the Earth Tree. He rises up and dives back down and headbutts the floor, but instead of just breaking his neck and dying like a normal, reasonable human being, he instead creates a massive frenzied flame explosion that I think is literally impossible to dodge. Try rolling it, try jumping it, it doesn't matter. The attack will seemingly break through your iframes and hit you, no matter what. This attack also covers the room in sweet looking frenzied flame, and Midra starts imbuing his sword with frenzy, which can light up the floor with frenzy inducing fire and creates huge flame AoEs and beams, and he darts around the room leaving frenzied flame trails. The dude is spewing that shit everywhere. 
so watch that build up carefully in his second phase. Also, watch out for his overhead stab. If he hits you, he'll make those barbs blend you from the inside out. So to win, you have to know the rhythm of his swings, and you have to manage your frenzy level and watch where you're stepping so you don't get mind obliterated by piss yellow schizoid fire. But with enough patience, Midra will be dusted. It's a pretty awesome battle that uses Frenzied Flame for some awesome and deadly attacks in tandem with Midra's unique and inhuman movements. And it never enters the realm of bullshit where the Frenzy meter gets stacked to the ceiling and you die extremely quickly from the buildup. Any death here is still on you for poor dodging skills and management, and the Frenzy is just extra punishment. It all coming together to make this fight one of the most unique and exciting in the entire expansion. High A tier. This is probably the first boss most players will fight in this DLC, and it is also probably the first boss not named Mesmer to be ever revealed to us through the gameplay trailers. The Divine Beast Dancing Lion has some powerful aura to him, and for good reason. This is probably one of From Software's most creative boss designs ever, being this horned lion puppet manned by two dancers, much like those Chinese New Year dancing lion puppets. And I just love the uncanny face, the glowing eyes, and the double layer of human and beast teeth. And that combined with the fact that you never actually see who's under the lion costume, makes this boss feel eerie and pretty intimidating just to look at. The lion itself has a deep bag of physical moves like big bites, head swipes, butt whips, and slams. And the lion's floaty and disjointed movements will take a bit to adjust to, like his weirdly timed flying corkscrew attack, and his command grab where the lion puppet chops his teeth together before grabbing you. And it's a pretty great and exciting time to learn how to get around these moves. The lion also has some magical moves, as to start, he can spray out big clouds of smoke in a stream or in a circle around him, like he just took a monster bong rip or something. And but once you get his health down a bit, the lion will rise up into the air, roar, and change his elemental affinity, which can be either lightning, frostbite, or wind elements, and the lion will be constantly changing his elements throughout the fight. The lightning will conjure up lightning pillars that give the lion delayed lightning bolt attacks, the frostbite will create massive ice crystal AoEs after it attacks, and the wind form can summon huge tornadoes and can shoot off wind projectiles at you. But the ice is the worst, as these AoEs can be tricky to avoid, and can build up frostbite from just his icy aura. And that frost making you take extra damage can nuke your run if you get caught in a combo. So, don't get too chilly. The elemental changes are a great aspect of this boss that keeps the fight constantly changing and dynamic. And I had a really great time with this one. Its unique moveset had me fully engaged trying to learn how to get around it. And the elemental changes were a great feature of this fight that constantly kept you managing your defense tactics. You got the lightning lion? Keep away from those lightning pillars. Got the ice lion? Master those dodge timings and AoEs. Got the wind lion? Master those projectile dodges? And learn how to haul ass away from the tornado. It gives the lion a lot of depth through essentially four unique phases. And that's on top of a fun and unusual moveset that makes the lion one of the best fights in the game. Just short of the top three for me. And beyond this point, we're getting into some legendary FromSoft bosses, with some of their best work yet. Starting with... No! 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 Ah! This is the greatest game of all time. This is the greatest dragon fight in From Software history. Calamite was cool, Madeir was a beast, and Placidusax was an experience. But Bale, oh Bale, this dude is generational. Now I've been gushing pretty much non-stop about how great I think the boss designs in this DLC are but I think Bale is my absolute favorite design in the entire expansion. There's just an incredible amount of visual storytelling here. He's a big black dragon with broken and tattered wings, and he's also missing half of his entire left leg, and he has to use his tail to support him on his left side, and his right wing has huge sharp bones jutting out of him that he uses like a walking cane. It's a perfect old man dragon design, and if you look closely, you can see two of Placidusax's heads embedded on his back. Showing us that Bale is the reason Plassey is all fucked up and looking like he's missing a few heads. As Bale had attacked him, which resulted in severe wounds for both dragons, and Bale had fled to the Jagged Peak to lick his wounds, while Placidusax had been left suspended in time in Far Missoula. But don't let those injuries fool you. Bale is still a beast, and like all dragons, he has several breath attacks, Bale having his own unique orange-yellow fire that I really like. And he also has orangish lightning attacks that he can summon down to chase you, or he will imbue his jagged bones with the lightning will slam down a huge attack, and it looks fucking sick. And of course he's got your expected physical moves like wing swipes, tail whips, and a huge chomp grab where he will dart towards you to gobble your ass up. And once you damage him enough, Bale will whip out the most visually spectacular attack in From Software history, where he grows massive glowing red wings in a huge eruption, flies up into the air, and summons fireballs down on you while circling the arena with lightning striking all around, 
before flying back down to Earth in a huge explosive slam. It's fucking gorillas, and I love it. And he's also got other insane moves like this extended flying slam, and this move where he breathes fire from a huge beam, and it looks so awesome. I was witnessing it all. To beat Bale, though, you need to be constantly locking on and off, targeting his head to read his incoming attacks, and locking off to attack his underbelly or his leg stump after a successful dodge. And you can't really take Bale head on, as his head is constantly moving and bobbing out of reach as he uses his wide range of attacks, making it too inconsistent of a target. So go for the toes and the stump. My only issue with this fight, and it's an extremely minor issue, is his get off me move where he just sprays fire on the ground beneath his feet. It's almost impossible to avoid if you're still under him when he pops it, but it doesn't do a ton of damage. So if Bale used this move, I usually just accept my fate, face tank the damage, get all the hair singe off my ball sack, recover, and get back to it. That and maybe Bale has a little less health than I expected, as at this point in the game you'll be pretty skidooed up, and you can rack up huge damage on him pretty quickly, which can make the fight feel over a bit prematurely in some cases. But besides these minor issues I have, this is by far my favorite dragon in a FromSoft game, and probably my favorite dragon fight in any game ever. And of course, who could forget about the summon for this fight, Egon, who has nothing but a burning hatred for Bale keeping him alive, and the voice acting is some god tier shit, and it adds a ton to the fight's stakes and the metal album cover aura it has. Curse you, Bale! With a hail of harpoons! With every last drop of my being! Even though I didn't summon him for the fight, as I wanted to do a strict and no summon run for this video, but man was I extremely tempted to. Egon is already on a Black Iron Tarkus level of beloved FromSoft summon characters. Also, it's a sweet Game of Thrones reference. Everything about this fight is so peak. Literally. The fight even takes place on the Jagged Peak, which itself is a super cool place to explore and traverse. It's just all around so good. S tier. I have had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking dark chamber. It's the guy on the box, and the second best boss in the game. He's the firstborn son of Queen Merica, her eternal crusader and ethnic cleanser of the Hornscent, cursed to forever lurk in the realm of shadow, waging an endless war against their long-forgotten horny foes, and is a certified serpent enjoyer. Like his name suggests, Mesmer will try to impale you with his spear, which he's got a deep bag of moves to skewer you with, like the basic spear swings, explosive spear jump throws, a command grab where he nukes your health bar by impaling you, and then lighting your skewered body on fire like a kebab with his dark red mesmerian flame. And this attack is just awesomely brutal. I really like the deep thunk sound it makes when you get speared like a fish. And he also has this stab flurry move that I really like, where he puts up some fire and stabs through it to spear you from a distance. And you gotta have the rhythm of this attack memorized to dodge it properly. And he may switch up the tempo of his strikes depending on how close you are to him. But his scariest attack is his trademarked mesmer combo where he jumps up, creates a huge circular snake flame, does a quick fire spear rush, and then slams down to summon spears out of the ground. The first attack and the spear slam are fine enough to dodge, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out the timing on his spear rush, and I usually just got poked a few times. But luckily, the damage on that attack is fairly weak, so it was no big deal to recover from. Mesmer also has a bevy of flame attacks like his delayed fireball, and he always opens the fight with a fire orb slam dunk move that instantly sets the tone and tempo of the fight off great. This first phase is a super balanced dance that requires you to know Mesmer's moves and timings by heart, and it feels almost like Radigan's fight in terms of how tight its design is. You have to figure out all his best openings through trial and error, and careful study of his moveset, as Mesmer won't give you much room to breathe at all, and some openings may need to be sacrificed in order to heal instead. That's just how oppressive this Snake Man is, and it's pretty great shit. But once Mesmer is down to about half health, he decides enough is enough. No broke-ass gray strip tarnish is gonna push him around. So he asks Merica for forgiveness, gouges his own eye out, and breaks it in his fingers, which is revealed to have been a seal to contain an abyssal serpent coiled up in his eye socket, and it's the source of his snake-infused lanklet build. His face also gets burned up, and his snakes turn a cool albino color. Mesmer is now a full base serpent, and now transforms into massive snakes that can attack you from above or horizontally, and all these snake attacks look fucking sick, although the attacks are huge and the snake can sometimes clip through the walls of the arena as it coils around to attack you from different angles, making the attacks a bit hard to follow at times. But it wasn't too big of an issue, and most of the snake attacks were clearly visible and telegraphed. It's also a pure dodging challenge, as you have to avoid the snake attacks until it gets tired and turns back into Mesmer in a big goop pile, leaving him wide open for counterattacks. He also has some new snaky attacks like this funny corkscrew move, on top of all his tricky phase 1 moves. 
but just stay locked in and punish those fairly long post-snake attack goop sessions. And soon enough, Mesmer will be slain. Such a great fight, man. Mesmer has a wide range of interesting and deadly moves, and the design and pace of this fight is so tight and extremely exciting. And the awesome second phase snake party and pretty awesome lore makes this battle one for the books. And I think Mesmer easily cracks the top five bosses in all of Elden Ring. It's simply a mesmerizing fight. In his last words of finally cursing his mother who had abandoned and locked him and his abyssal serpent away forever in the land of shadow, really hit hard for me, as despite Mesmer's love and devotion to America to endlessly carry out her crusade, America still feared the base serpent within him, and used the crusade as not only revenge against the Hornset, but also as a way to seal away the power of her firstborn son for good. It's a really tragic story, and I feel pretty bad for murking Messman here. Mass murderers have feelings too, you know. S for snake deer. But with that, you probably know what's coming. And the best fight in all of Shadow of the Earth Tree is... Okay, okay, hear me out. As you may know, this fight has been more than a bit controversial. Not only is this final boss staple your balls and gonads to the ceiling hard, many players were upset with just who we were fighting. Some were angry that we weren't fighting someone like Godwin who many players theorized was going to be revived by Mikola, or even a brand new boss. I was hoping for something like a Shadow America, personally. But nope. To the chagrin of many players and lore theorizers, at the pussy gates to godhood stood Prime General Radon, cured from his Scarlet Rot Hepatitis, and looking noticeably smaller and skinnier than his bloated and rotten Star Scourge form, and sporting some omen horns on his arms and legs. As this is technically Moog's body with Radon's soul in it. You see? Mikola had actually charmed Moog into abducting him, so Moog could be slain, and then his body later used as a vessel for Radon's return, who was Mikola's chosen consort this whole time, as revealed by a memory cutscene after beating the boss. Then I apologize to Moog for calling him a crib-robbing pedo in my last Elden Ring video. Not only did he beat the allegations, he was actually the victim in this whole situation, and now his body is being used as a vessel for the Mikolin-controlled soul of Radon. I never would have expected that. A little blonde boy is a demon. Now, many players didn't like the reveal of Radon as Mikola's consort either, as Mikola's whole shtick is being the ethereal god of compassion. So why would he choose the war-loving, slaughter-gang, soul-snatcher General Radon to be his consort instead of someone, say, like the player? Well, I can understand the disappointment with the final boss being a Radon rematch, but at the same time, I'm so down with a showdown with a prime Radon, as long as the fight is fun and exciting. We constantly hear about how he's the biggest, baddest, and strongest of all the demigods, and when we face him, we're a bit late on the party. He's essentially a rotten husk of a man. Bloated, rotting skin, and he's even missing feet from untold years rotting away in the Caled Wilds, yet managing to live on through sheer willpower alone. And even then he was a total beast, so a Prime Radon must be absolutely godly. Also, he's apparently Miyazaki's favorite demigod, and I completely trust him to cook up a sick-ass boss fight that does the character justice. And as for Mickey's plan to marry Radon feeling shoehorned in or nonsensical, I kind of get that too, because if the plan was to get hitched to Radon and make him your consort as the new god of the world, then what was all that Halig tree shit for? Why have Melania nuke him with a scarlet rot bomb? Why Radon at all? And in my view, these are all questions that we simply don't have enough information to properly answer. We know about Radon's deeds and what he's capable of, but what we don't know is what Radon the man is like. Sure, he's a powerful general who revels in war and killing, and is probably the strongest warrior in all of the lands between but we also simply don't know much about his personality, nor his post-shattering motivations and goals. Off the battlefield, he may have been surprisingly kind and level-headed, which would contrast with his apparent bloodthirstiness and love for mass murder. We know that Radon commands strong loyalty and deep respect amongst his men, which cruel leaders usually aren't able to achieve. Just look at Godric, nobody's gassing him up, even his own goons hate his guts. Whereas Radon has guys like Jaren holding Radon festivals for untold amounts of time, just to honor his legacy, in an attempt to give him the warrior's death he's always desired. And we also know that Radon had mastered gravity magic originally as a way to keep riding his feeble but beloved horse Leonard, which strongly hints that Radon can at least show strong compassion and care for those he loves. And I think this dichotomy could be extremely interesting, and would track really well with George R. R. Martin's character writing styles, as Elden Ring is still his concept and characters. And I could see Radon being a sort of Jamie Lannister type character, sibling incest and all, who on the surface, Seems like a warmongering and cruel man who lives to kill and wage war, but on a personal level, could be very kind, compassionate, and fair to the people around him, 
And why wouldn't Mikola want to consort with the strongest and most level-headed demigod? It's a lot like Merica and Godfrey. Radon would be the muscle Mikola would need to establish his godly rule and to crush any of his enemies with. Compassion and mind control is nice, but it'll only get you so far. Sometimes you just need to let that steel fly. And all this is to basically say, I'm totally cool with this plot development. And I think if these assumptions I made are true, it could explain Mickey's thought process here quite a lot. But at the same time, we simply don't know enough about these characters' thought processes and motivations. And as for the fight itself, oh god. Well, first things first. The first phase of this fight is actually really great. Radon mostly uses a wide array of sword combos, and there is literally no other option than to master all of Radon's attacks. Know how to dodge each possible sword combo combination, learn how to read if Radon will do one or two jump attacks on a slam, master his fast as hell gravity pull AoE, learn how to consistently outrun his rock meteor attack, learn the exact timing for each counterattack window, and so on. This whole first phase is a training course for the second phase, as it all builds off his first phase moveset. And this second phase starts when you take off around one-fourth of Radon's health. And when you do, Mikola himself appears from the Coochie Corpse Gate and wraps himself around Radon's back, much like how Sarosh is piggybacking off Godfrey. And this is our first time seeing Mickey in the flesh. Sort of. The whole DLC were following in his trail and crosses, and he has the strongest presence out of any of the demigods in the base game. Even Melania is completely subservient to him, and he looks about what I would expect. That is a lot of hair. He gives Radon an even more godly aura, and it reminds me a lot of Lorien and Lothric. Hey, any DS3 heads in the crowd? Anyway, this second phase is probably, no joke, the most difficult video game boss I have ever encountered, and it took me around 6 plus hours to beat this guy. It's kinda nuts. I think I even saw guys like Kaisenat take 50 plus hours to beat this guy. All of Radon's attacks, besides a select few like his gravity corkscrew dive, now leave holy pillars of light where he last swung, and these pillars are brutal making even the smallest combos extremely deadly. Each hit is now a double hit. Good luck. And on top of this, he's also got new moves like his light speed multi-hits that I just straight up could not avoid for the life of me. And my best bet to get around these attacks was to just tank the multi-hits and then dodge his actual final attack, as his last attack usually launches right into a combo that can easily melt you if you're off guard. And if you get caught in his gravity pull, you're pretty much fucked, as Radon will create a massive, almost impossible to dodge gravity rock AoE, jump up, do a light speed multi-hit, and then do the fucking gravity rock AoE again. Fuck you! And this is all on top of huge incantations that Mickey whips out like this huge fuck off frame rate destroying light nuke that I just gave up on trying to dodge if it was close enough. A light speed meteor impact, and some brand new combos to learn the timing to. And most interestingly, a grab where Mikola will try to charm you with some sweet promises. And if you get grabbed twice, you automatically lose and get your heart stolen by Mikola which I thought was a really cool way to show his main power of mind and soul domination. And it all combines for a fucking oppressive experience, and it felt almost insurmountable at times. I was lasting around 30 to 40 seconds on a good run. I had even equipped America's Bray Talisman to help me negate this holy damage nonsense. And that's the first time in the entire expansion I had to really modify my loadout just to beat a boss, which I commend it for. And despite this insanely brutal design, where just one wrong move can get you killed, I think I kinda love this boss. It was such an amazing feeling just to get him down to less than half health, and slowly learning how to avoid the endless light pillars was incredibly satisfying, having to constantly be circling Radon to stay out of the light, and having to know his movements and attack rhythms by heart, as Mickey's huge golden hair covers most of Radon's body at most angles, making it even harder to dodge his combos due to your worsened vision. But just keep at it. Keep fighting. You need to humble yourself before Radon and his morally dubious little boy husband. And with enough practice, and time, and blood, and sweat, and tears. Even this Yaoi God duo will fall, and it will be one of the greatest and most satisfying feelings you'll ever get from a game. Your heart rate will be in the triple digits, your hands will quiver, and your shit will be on diamonds. No joke, winning this fight felt better than nutting, and that's all despite the brutal second phase zero to death combos, seemingly unavoidable light speed attacks, and the frame rate issues. But at the same time, as far as we know, this is the last boss of all of Elden Ring. So I want this to be a 6 hour long total motherfucker of a fight, and I want to feel like a god when I'm done with it. And that's pretty much exactly what I got. And I understand if it's too much for some, but for me, I love this battle as the penultimate FromSoft patented hardest shit DLC final boss that's in the same vein as Manus, Orphan of Kos, and Gale who came before these guys. And it was still fun to play even on my like 80th try. And I think they completely nailed it. Eh, 99% nailed it. 
Maybe the second phase could have started slightly later. Those light speed attacks could be a bit more clear and consistent to dodge. Uh, we get very little lore reveals or explanations after the fight is over. Mickey and Radon just kind of accept their death stoically and disappear. So that's kind of disappointing. But still, holy fuck. What a duel. S for suck my nuts tier. And with that, that's all the Shadow of the Erdtree bosses ranked. And of course, that was just my opinion. You probably have some bosses in other positions, and that's totally fine. Feel free to let me know. And if this video does well enough, maybe I'll put it all together for a complete Elden Ring boss ranking. That could be fun. But for now, that's all I got. If you're still here, thank you so much for watching. And I love you all. Goodbye.